Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, being beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. That, that prayer that we just offered for today is the colic for the last Sunday of Epiphany. Whatever day of the month or whatever day, Sunday in the, in the year, it's always the last Sunday of Epiphany. We hear that colic. Now, there could be more Sundays in Epiphany, but the last one, the one just before Lent begins, is always Transfiguration Sunday. Like Jesus in the Gospel narrative, this is the Sunday where we all start to make that turn. It's a slow turn, but we get, begin to make it to face and begin our journey towards Jerusalem. For whether we're ready or not, Lent is upon us. This week is Ash Wednesday. It was while praying and reflecting on this colleague that I was struck with two, two ideas that I really needed to struggle with. The first was this idea of bearing our cross. I've never liked that phrase. I mean, for most people, bearing our cross means that we're carrying some burden, some guilt or responsibility, and we've got to carry it all by ourselves. 
And the reason that has troubled me is because I don't see carrying a cross as something that is supposed to be such a burden and, and that I have to do it alone. Because even Jesus had Simon of Cyrene as a helper, as a partner in carrying his cross. For me, carrying a cross is the risk that we take to bring about a change, to bring about new life. But that's for another Sunday. Today I want to focus on the other phrase that I reflected on. And that's the phrase that says, being changed into his likeness. That's transfiguration, isn't it? That's transformation. It's the story in our gospel today. The story of the transfiguration of Jesus appears in all three gospels. It is about this transformation that the disciples saw. But transformation for us today is a lifelong pursuit. For Jesus on that mountain, it may have been just a few moments. But for us, transformation begins with our baptism. And it continues until we die. In the gospel narrative of the transfiguration of Jesus, we, like the disciples who were present, are, are simply overwhelmed by this moment in in the words of of the gospel writer they say his clothes became so dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them this is a great moment of glorification for jesus glory by biblical definition is used to describe the manifestation of god's presence and our experience of that we especially hear this in the Psalms. Take, for example, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Or Psalm 63. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will, will glorify you. Now, these characteristics of this glory seem so bold and so bright that it overwhelms us. Consider God's glory that is reflected in Christ's transfiguration in a moment. Think about poor Peter. Once again, he stammers and he stutters, and before realizing what he's saying, out comes these words about building three booths so that we can remember this. But I don't think that's what the moment was all about. God's glory is not about special effects, bright lights, heavenly choruses. God's glory, God's awesomeness, as described in Paul's epistle, is reflected in the light of the gospel, the good news, the message that Jesus shared. God's glory is a reflection of God's desire for us, our lives, and the kingdom that is now but not yet complete. As Paul in his epistle reminds us, Jesus is the image of God. What we know and experience of God, we know because of Jesus and his ministry, his way of being in the world. The glory of God is, of course, also known in other ways. Many of us know God's glory as we experience it in creation. That is why so many of you are so passionate about caring for God's creation. Creation is a reflection of God's glory, God's greatness and power, God's desire for peace and harmony, God's caring for all life. But there's still another way God's glory shines in the world and is made known. Hear what Paul writes in the epistle this morning. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. 
Now, our heart in Hebrew is the place for our true identity, our soul. And it is this soul that contains the knowledge of God's glory. Our heart as believers has experienced the glory of God as seen in Jesus Christ. We know it and we have faith in it. This glory that lives within us through the Holy Spirit is what gives our lives our passion and the power to live a glorious life. The passion that empowers us in our work, in our lives, in our relationship does not come from us, though. We fool ourselves with such, if we believe such ideas. As Paul writes to the people of Corinth about himself, the words he uses are also true for us. Listen to what he says. For we do not preach ourselves, he writes, rather we preach Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. It is the glory of God that lives within us and that is what empowers us and that we reflect as we live and work and serve. Today's reading from, this, from 2 Corinthians leaves out some really important verses, however. The lectionary directs us to stop at verse 6, but I'm going to take you a little deeper into chapter 4. Here are verses 7 and 9. 7 through 10, I'm sorry. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. Here are those same lines in a modern translation from the message. Maybe it'll be a little easier to understand. The message writes, if you only look at us, you might well miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. As it is, there's not much chance of that. You know for yourselves that we're not much to look at. We've been surra surrounded and battered by troubles, but we are not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. What they did to Jesus, they did to us. Trial and torture, mockery and murder. What Jesus did among them, he did in us. He lives. Our lives, our lives are at a constant risk for Jesus' sake, which makes Jesus' life all the more evident in us. While we're going through the worst, you are getting the best. Don't you relate to Paul's writing? First, don't we all feel a bit battered and demoralized? We are not sure what to do. It's been 11 months since we have gathered in person. The pandemic has battered our bodies and also our spirits. We, we grieve for families and friends, and we worry about the economics of it all. And even those who have taken this time to exercise and eat right, the isolation has tortured us and wounded our very spirit. 
But as Paul reminds us, God through all this never left Paul's side and has not left our side. We are and will always be, because of our creation, bearers of the image of God. We are created from the clay of the earth. And as we will recall on Wednesday, we will someday return to that dust. But in the meantime, we are like jars of clay. Now, clay jars in the Hebrew culture and in many of the early cultures were quite functional and very necessary. Clay jars were the only functional, were one of the most important functional pieces in, our, in a person's home. They, they, they were so functional because they could hold stuff whether it was water or whether it was grain or, or simply some of the junk around the house. Now, of course, jars made out of clay are fragile. They could be easily chipped or cracked, even broken. But they were necessary and valuable for daily life. And we are those jars of clay. We can easily be hurt or cracked or even broken. But we are seen as valuable and necessary in God's kingdom building. We hold the treasure. We not only bear God's image, we reflect the glory of God as we share the light of Christ that lives within each of us. And as Paul said, though we carry death with us, we also reflect Christ resurrected life. As simple clay jars, we know that it is not us, it is Christ in us that inspires us to love and to serve. It is Christ in us that empowers us to do the heavy lifting of building God's kingdom, preaching peace and justice and equality. It is Christ in us that calls us to pray, to heal, to restore the unseen and lost. We prayed in the colic today to be changed into the likeness of Christ. Paul reminds us that we hold that treasure in our fragile lives. The question we are called to answer is how will we display God's glory as we reflect the light of Christ in the context of our own lives. Maybe that is the true turning that needs to happen in Lent this year. How will we care for the clay jars of our lives and turn on our light to the fullness and brightness that Christ is calling us to reflect? Amen.